Visionaries is produced in partnership with the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard Kennedy School. And is made possible in part by Halloran Philanthropies. Additional funds have been provided by the following. Visionaries is proud to present its 16th season on public television. Sometimes you read the paper and watch the news and it seems like there's more bad news than good in the world. But you know what? It's just not true. I at least can hold on to something, that there's something, that, you know, maybe it's small, but there's something that I'm doing to make a difference. It's just a feeling that you have. You can help people. You have to. There's no alternative. Every child has potential that we just can't know. And so to my mind, that's what we're doing. We are saving potential for the future. Born in 354 AD, this man was not your typical saint. Before converting to Catholicism, he struggled with his faith and human temptations. But in those darker moments, he saw the light, an important theme among Augustinians today. Talk about journey. The man was trying to search for meaning and purpose in his life. Eventually uh, met a woman, had a child out of wedlock. He, as a 42-year-old bishop, decided to write down uh, his, you might say, his personal salvation history story. And in it, he was bearing his heart how he was lost in lots of ways. But he came to the sense later after his conversion that God was with him even though he was not with God in all that madness. So we Augustinians were not so much taken with imposing a spirituality on people. In other words, this is how you should be. But what is your experience of life? Tell us how God has been with you in your journey. That's our role to be able to say, God was with you, even in these darker moments, even in these confusing moments, even in these mysterious moments. So, regardless of what we do, foreign missions, taste and local missions, teaching, uh, parish life, the agenda for uh, an Augustinian is to live together in community, to be able to understand how God is with us and to be able to bring that to the people with whom we're living and uh, ministering. Philadelphia is where we began this whole journey. Bishop Carroll in 1794 uh, put out an invitation for um, the Augustinians to respond to the needs in this country, and Father Matthew Carr came here, uh, responding to the needs of an immigrant church, primarily the Irish. We're kind of the foot soldiers. We're, we're out front, uh, and we're always looking at uh, the challenges that uh, people uh, face. So we have an organization in the city now called ADROP, Augustinian Defenders of the Rights of the Poor, that try to catch people who are falling between the cracks educationally, medically, their status as uh, immigrants. Augustinian Defenders of the Rights of the Poor, ADROP, has a very simple mission. It is to match known resources with identified needs. So that's where we got to our health clinic. How are your medicines? Do you have a supply of your medicines still? The Unity Clinic is a primary caregiving operation 
in which we uh, try to meet the needs of people who are uninsured or underinsured in the community. When they come in, it's been many years since any of them have had any kind of health care. Um, and the fact that we are free helps them a great deal. And when Dr. Dean's ready, we'll call you in. Okay? We have the same phenomenon happening in, in Peru. We were invited into that setting because of the dire poverty and the need to bring resources in terms of knowledge about tapping water for wells, agriculture. So we've, we're still there transforming as best we can the culture down there for people to be um, self-reliant. Twelve years ago, the Augustinians took on one of their greatest challenges. They started a mission outside of Durban, South Africa. Today, just 16 years after the end of apartheid, the divisions between whites and blacks here remain. Among the native Zulu population, unemployment is as high as 100%. And where the Augustinians work, over half the population has HIV AIDS. Durban is located on the east coast of South Africa. In the province of KwaZulu Natal, which is KwaZulu, meaning the land of the Zulus. Among the Zulus, there's a high level of poverty, and a big part of that is the remnants of apartheid. There were laws in place that made it more challenging for the Zulus to find work in different places. It was a structure in place to ensure poverty. One of the difficulties is to really succeed and do well in this country, uh, which has a, a developed economy. On, in terms of speaking about Africa, South Africa is one of the best and strongest economies. But that means a lot of their business is done in English and a lot of the better paying jobs and more sustainable jobs involve some technical skills. If you go to any Zulu public school, high school, primary school, most likely all classes will be taught in Zulu and they won't have any technological skills that they can develop at all. I think that's a big part of the role of the Augustinians being here and the work that they're doing in the valley is to create some change in that respect. I can remember one of the first times I went to St. Leo's. There were no desks. There were no blackboards. There were no textbooks. There was no electricity. There was no running water. Imagine 300 little kids using pit latrines every day. And I looked at that place and I thought, wow, how does education happen here? St. Leo's now has about three more classroom buildings. They have electricity. They have running water. They have some textbooks. They have blackboards. They now have 685 children. From 300 to 685. A tremendous growth.
many things has happened to our school since uh, uh, St. Augustinian uh, friars came to our school. It's the only school that has a, a computer lab. It is the only school teaching oral lessons. The volunteers from overseas are able to teach uh, English. He's going to teach us about, what does this one say? Taste. Taste, Taste and, and smell. Excellent. Good. Some of the children, they're really coming from disadvantaged home, where some of them, they are child-headed family because they, the mother died, the father died. And they know if they come to the school, that they will be cared of. They will be looked after. My name is Nelly and I'm 10 years old. I have one brother and 10 sisters. My mom was a very good person to me and she was kind to me. And I love her the most. Before she died, he got sick and cough and sleep all day. And I wasn't happy about that. And I always pray, pray. And after that, she goes to the hospital. And I cry and cry. And, and I told myself that I don't have to cry because God did what he's in the best. Yeah, that's it. I love to go to school because it is the best thing I need in my life that could make my tomorrow be good, be nice, be happy, be excited. And that can make my future go well. Yeah, I love school, especially. <laughs> They send our Kassini and Indian frogs. They organize the breakfast. They organize uh, the afternoon meal. And they've made a big change with us, a big one. At least now we, uh, we are able to feed the learners. They usually come to school with empty stomach. At St. Leo's, a piece of fruit is provided every day. That's such an essential part of giving people vitamins and then building up your immune system. This room is important. It's where we keep all the fruit for the whole week. I've got the pearls, bananas, and those learners who are taking the antiretroviral drugs, we gave them the red apples. They said when they are teaching us about HIV and AIDS, we mustn't give them the green apples because there is a lot of acid in green apples. <laughs>